Welcome to Vermont PBS's Election 2014 Candidate Debates, with all the candidates on the ballot invited to participate. Tonight, the candidates for Governor of Vermont. Here's moderator Stuart Ledbetter. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our biennial debate featuring the candidates for governor of our state. I'm Stuart Ledbetter, News Channel 5 and host of Vermont This Week, seen uh, here on Vermont PBS. As you heard, we've invited all seven candidates whose names appear on the ballot for governor this year to be with us tonight, and all seven have joined us. Positioned in alphabetical order from left to right, they are Peter Diamondstone, representing the Liberty Union Party, Chris Erickson, an independent, Dan Feliciano, representing the Libertarian Party. Scott Milne is the Republican nominee. Bernie Peters is an independent. Emily Payton is an independent. And Peter Shumlin is the nominee of the Democratic Party this year. Our format's pretty straightforward tonight. I'll ask a question. Everyone gets a minute to respond. If needed, I might ask one or more to rebut, but we'll try to keep things moving thanks to our timekeeper, uh, Laura, who's sitting at my, uh, at my right. And we'll have time for a closing statement as well. We have questions in the queue from Vermont PBS viewers, and here in our studio we have high school and college students from across Vermont. They'll participate, and we welcome them too. So let's begin. Some of you are well known to the people of our state. Uh, many of you, I dare say, are not. So why don't we begin by telling us a little bit about yourselves and how you've prepared for the top political office uh, in the land. Mr. Diamondstone? Uh, I am a revolutionary nonviolent socialist, and I am a secessionist. Um, a member of the American Legion, a uh, member of Vermont, of uh, Veterans for Peace. Um, I've lived in Vermont for almost 50 years. My spouse and I reside in Brattleboro. All four of my children and most of my grandchildren uh, live in Wyndham County. A couple have moved away, but most of them still live at home, uh, live in Wyndham County. Um, as a revolutionary socialist, I have to tell you that most of what we have to dis most of what we have to discuss tonight will not be relevant for me because most of what I will be talking about is how we overturn what's destroying our society and our environment, which is capitalism, um, represented, uh, I guess, by this bottle of water on my, on my table here. Um, Thank you. Ms. Erickson. Yes, when I was a child, I felt Vermont was the Garden of Eden. It was beautiful. You could drink from the streams, from pure mountain streams, perfectly clear water. Lake Champlain was perfect and clear and beautiful. During my married years for 12 years, I lived in Los Angeles. And one time I was riding the bus across Los Angeles, a 12-mile trip from Santa Monica to downtown LA, and an old lady sat next to me. And she said, look out the window. That used to be all wheat fields and orange groves. When my husband died and I moved back to Vermont in 1995, I was determined that that wouldn't happen to Vermont. And we've got to stop things. We've got to stop the F-35 strike fighter jets from being based here. And we've got to stop the natural gas pipeline from being built underneath Lake Champlain. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Feliciano. Hi, I'm Dan Feliciano. I'm a father, I'm a husband, and I'm a veteran. I have three children. I live here in Essex. And I, got determined, I was determined to get into the debate because my wife and I were having a conversation. And she said, now that our son's 16, we need to start thinking about what we're going to do differently because he will be leaving and never coming back. That the prospects for a young person in Vermont are horrible. And I decided at that point, I need to do something about this and I couldn't stand idly by. I have a background in healthcare, and I have a background turning around and fixing large government agencies as well as large businesses. And I thought that my skills would be applicable to turning the state around and doing some things to make the state more affordable for my family, providing better health care for my family, reducing property taxes, and providing school choice that so many young parents are, um, are yearn for. Thank you. Mr. Milne. 
Thank you, Stuart. Um, my name is Scott Milne. I'm a uh, uh, third generation uh, uh, born in Vermont. Uh, take that back. I was born in Brooklyn. I got here about 90 days after I was uh, born. My dad was a, uh, uh, in law school. My mom was a New Yorker. Uh, I love Vermont. Uh, I moved back to Vermont in uh, the late 80s to take over uh, a small part of uh, a family business. Uh, that business was located in New Hampshire, was a New Hampshire corporation. Uh, because of the gratitude I felt towards Vermont, because of the uh, love I have for Vermont, I chose to live on the Vermont side of the border to bring my family up in Vermont, uh, be a little closer to my parents and folks I grew up with. But what I saw over the last 30 years is a continuing difference between New Hampshire and Vermont and the effect of tax policies and and government on the ability of people to prosper. And uh, that's drawn me into this race, and I feel like I will offer a great voice for people that choose to support me. Thank you. Mr. Peters. My name is Bernard Peters. Been married for 47 years, a veteran. Retired from the Agency of Transportation after 36 years. Did construction all my life, off and on. And I've been watching politics for quite some time. And I'm really kind of disappointed. That's why I'm running, because it's got to the point, from what I see is, whichever party is in power is not working for the Vermonter. Neither party seems to realize when they say they're working for the party, they're not working for the party. They're working for the taxpayer and the voter. Them are the people who are boss, not the other way around. And it's time for somebody to go back in there and work for the people. Answer some of these questions, solve some of these problems, and all it takes is a lot of good common sense and hard work from everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Payton. Uh, my name is Emily Payton, and I'm from the lower part of the state in Putney. And I am an earth activist. Uh, we live in incredible times. And your generation are going to be facing some serious predicaments. Uh, I consider myself what is known as a light worker. And why I'm in the race is to bring forth the very exciting solutions and the hopeful solutions that you have to help make the earth a livable place, a place that you can thrive. Often the solutions aren't being discussed by the two-party system. So that's why I'm here to talk about um, uh, economic systems that can allow us to laterally grow the economy and things that we can do to honor the earth and to live in harmony with each other and our natural world. Thank you. And finally, Peter Shumlin. I'm Peter Shumlin. I've had the privilege of serving as your governor for the last four years. I was born in Putney. I'm the first governor, I think, since Dean Davis, who was born and raised in this state. My brothers and sisters also live and work in Vermont. I've raised two beautiful daughters in this state. I love Vermont more than anything, and I ran for governor four years ago because after building two businesses, successful businesses in Vermont, employing Vermonters, I felt that I wanted more students, more young people, to have the same opportunity that I've had in this state. Every day, I focus, in my job as governor, on helping to build jobs, economic opportunity, improve the quality of life, and make this a state where our kids can stay and work and thrive. We've had some great successes, I'm asking you for two more years so that we can continue the good work that we have begun. Thank you, candidates. A uh, lot of issues in this campaign, but a couple of them uh, certainly rise to the top. Let's begin with health care. The state has uh, certainly struggled to implement the uh, uh, Affordable Care Act. The website tonight is offline. And there are many questions in the minds of many Vermonters about whether we can proceed uh, and how rapidly to a single-payer health care system uh, embraced by the governor. Uh, this week we heard some polling that suggests that Vermonters are deeply divided on this question, and so I would ask each of you to clarify your plans for health care reform. Mr. Feliciano, let's begin with you. I've come out strongly against the single payer. I think the Vermont Health Connect, which is th separate and distinct from um, the single payer, demonstrates the ineptness of the administration to implement an IT system. 
Healthcare is a heavily IT-based solution, and I think that going to a single-payer system really doesn't do anything to drive down the cost of healthcare. What I proposed is opening up the marketplace to more insurers. Just as when you go shopping, you don't want to pick from two products, you want to have a multitude of products, you'll have a multiple selection of payers that would compete on premium for your business and for your services. I also would focus in on helping the healthcare organizations, the patients, the payers, as well as the insurers, then on the, the state, to implement a solution that actually tackles the cost of healthcare. 75% of healthcare costs are derived from chronic illness and disease, and single payer does nothing actually to address that as it's being addressed today. So I'm against the single payer system. I think free market solutions work best. I want you to have more choice, not less choices. You pick your doctor, you pick your hospital, you pick your, your insurer. Mr. Shellen, how does that sound to you? Well, it won't surprise Dan that we have very different views on health care. Listen, as someone who wants to create jobs and economic opportunity in Vermont, and as a business person before I was governor, I can tell you that the biggest obstacle to income growth for Vermonters and to job growth for business people is the ever-rising cost of health care. So what a single-payer system or universal access will do for Vermont are two things. First, to move from a system that's spending literally 20 cents on every dollar that Vermonters make. Remember that, on average, we spend 20 cents on a buck on health care. Move to a system that reimburses our providers for outcomes, for quality of care, instead of the current fee-for-service quantity of care. Secondly, I want to move to a system where every Vermonter has health care because they're a resident of Vermont, not because of how wealthy they might be or where or how lucky they might be where they work. And finally, a system that is affordable, universal, and publicly financed. Now what I've said many times is this will help to contain cost and to move Vermont to a more affordable state as well as create jobs. Thank you. Mr. Diamondstone? Um, I support single-payer as a second line. I don't consider it a first line in any way. The Liberty Union platform begins with a statement that says it's a one-page platform been in existence since the whole page since 1978 with very little changes. It says, the role of government, all governments, is to provide a materially secure life for everyone on the planet, including socialized medicine, which is socialized healthcare, which is different than single payer. See, single payer is a mechanism. Um, but one of the things we would do is get rid of private enterprise in the, in the pharmaceutical business. That should be community-owned business. Uh, all, all workers uh, who are providers would be on community payrolls. That's socialized medicine, and that's what we need to change from. Competition is very, very wasteful, and whether it's in industry and business. Thank you. Mr. Milne, your plans for health care reform. Um, first of all, I, um, I disagree with uh, Peter Shumlin. I, unfortunately for Vermonters, and especially I guess for the folks that uh, believed uh, this, uh, what I would uh, d call a reckless march towards uh, single payer, uh, folks that believe that that was going to be a solution for us uh, four years into it, almost four years into it, uh, Peter's number one priority has really turned out to be his number one failure. This was a program uh, that we were sold as going to revitalize our economy, create jobs, get us back on track, and do all these great things for healthcare. We're almost four years into it. Um, we had a technology system that's a disaster. Uh, we've got um, a median household income in Vermont that dropped by 2% last year. We've got 3,000 more people in poverty last year than we did the year before. So if this was going to fix our economy, it clearly is not doing it. Single payer is dead. There's no possible way it's going to happen by 2017. I'll tell you that now. I'll tell you that when I'm governor. I think Peter's going to wait until he's governor to tell you that. All right, uh, Ms. Erickson. Yes, I'm going to put out a statewide referendum and give voters a choice, 1%, 2%, 3%, up to 10%, and say how much of your total annual income do you think would be fair to pay in a tax for health care to pay for public health care clinics and public health care hospitals, which would be no cost when you use them because you've already paid for them with your tax, just like a public school K to 12. You don't 
pay an extra insurance when you send your kid to school. You've already paid for it by tax. And then anybody who isn't satisfied with the public health care clinics and the public health care hospitals, which are paid by a tax, would buy their own insurance, but I would make certain that all insurance companies in the United States of America can sell their products in Vermont, no more monopolies. Thanks. Ms. Payton? Well, I'd like to deal with the root causes of ill health. Uh, we need to look at the financial stress, the fact that there isn't enough money in circulation for people to participate in the economy and the types of, of ill health that that causes. Uh, there are ways to deal with that. We also really need to uh, create a, as, as pristine an environment as possible. We ought to ban Monsanto, uh, and we ought to really understand that a clean earth, clean air, and clean water are why we are so healthy. Those are our, our treasures. As far as the, the dollars that we spend in health care, uh, some of them, they ought to all go to the healers, the doctors. And we ought to look carefully where we are supporting a medical industry, like a big pharmaceutical industry, that is, really wants people to be sick. So we need to make differentiations. And I do believe that we ought to um, make sure that anybody can go to the doctor. But I don't think we should support profits of uh, industry invested in sickness. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Peters, how would you proceed with health care reform? Well, I think right now we've, we've uh, farmed out a lot of ideas to other states to cure our problems, and it's cost us an awful lot of money, and we have nothing to show for it. We've we spent millions of dollars and really have nothing to show for it. If you're going to have health care, who needs to be involved? Your doctors, your nurses, your therapists, and guess who? The patient. I mean, anybody ever thought to ask the patient what they might like to go on with everything else? And as far as, as the health care, it, you got to start somewhere. We got some of the nicest schools on the East Coast for educating people. Maybe we ought to let them do it as a as a school project. We could probably get some good ideas from a lot of these good schools we have on in the state of Vermont. Thanks, uh, Mr. Milne has tonight called you reckless, uh, Mr. Shumlin. Uh, he he's done that a couple of times this week uh, uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, how do you respond to that? It makes it sound as if you've been irresponsible about pushing this agenda that, as we said at the outset, is so divisive uh, and has split the state. You know, the Vermonters that I hear from would rather hear a candidate talk about what they're going to do if they're elected governor than call other candidates' names. So I'm going to stay away from that. But I will tell you what concerns me. Uh, the biggest threat to job growth is the rising cost of health care. I mentioned that we're spending 20 cents of every dollar on health care. If health care costs grow for this decade at the same rate that they did last decade, that number doubles. So that's why I'm so intent on getting this right, on a universal health care system where we contain cost, reduce cost for business, reduce cost for Vermonters with better outcomes. The rest of the world has figured out how to do this. We can too. And it takes courage to get it right. I believe we must. And Mr. Milne, to follow up, you said that it's dead in 2017, but is there a point in the future where, when you would say yes? Um, uh, thank you for the question, Stuart. I uh, got into this campaign. One of the promises I made to people is that I, A, will always listen before I act, uh, and that we really need to focus on what's practical and drive decisions from practicality versus some political agenda, which I would argue is what's gotten us where we are with health care. As we get through fixing the mess, figuring out what we're going to use for an exchange going forward, 2015 will be a year for a cost-benefit analysis on how we move forward if the Optum exchange does work. Once we get uh, five years down the road, if things look great and other states have been successful with uh, single payer or some sort of government-run health care, I'm more than happy to look at it, but it'll be based on facts and practicality. Let's single payer is not the way to go. Let's, let's, let's be honest here, right? The economy has been stagnant, Pete. It has not grown. If you were so concerned about the economy growing, you would have dropped that Vermont Health Connect system and started reducing health care costs. In prison, health care costs are the second highest in the country at $17,000 a year. If you wanted to demonstrate that you could actually cut costs, you would have started there and proven to everyone that the inmate system would have been the place to start. You have not done that. Anybody else want to get a final word there, or shall we bring in our student audience uh, tonight? 
All right, quickly. We ought to have used our, the money that we spent on the Health Connect website, we ought to have given it to Lake Sh the Champlain College because we have uh, the intelligence here and we ought to contract within state as a way to build our uh, economy. La last word. You can't finance this in any way other than an increase in taxes and that increase in taxes has to come by decoupling from the federal income tax that has all the loopholes built into it so that we can tax the wealthy who are now paying less than their fair share and you can just see how much social security tax they pay on their um, uh, uh, earnings in the stock market on dividends and on uh, 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 interest in their bonds. Ms. Erickson, final word. The, the problem, Peter, was you had no lemon law um, you know, phrase in your contract. If you had a lemon law phrase in your contract and, and the website didn't work out, you could have said, give us our money back. As we said at the outset, we have uh, some of Vermont's uh, finest uh, high school and college students from ar around the state here, and some of them have some questions for our candidates tonight. Uh, the first I understand concerns college tuition in this state. Go ahead, sir. Colleges in Vermont are not appealing to Vermonters, students from other states, and from around the world because they are expensive. How are you going to help lower tuition fees and attract students to go to Vermont colleges and universities? Start with Mr. Peters. Good question. The school has always been very expensive in the state. I mean, that's what basically takes the biggest amount of tax dollars. Something that takes a lot of tax dollars is really hard to change. I know it can be looked at. It's going to have to be really examined really close. The total answer, I, base, I can't really give that to you right now because that's been a question for how long, school tuition, school tax, and it's still a, it's still a problem. It's going to take some real serious get together from the legislators and the senators to get onto this. They need to get onto this too. They know what's happening. They could help cure this problem, I believe, if they really wanted to. Mr. Feliciano? So, so my, my uncle's actually president of Manhattan College in New York City, and we had a recent conversation about what's taking place in, in, um, acad in academia. One of the problems we're seeing is that students are not prepared when they go into college. So that adds an, an incredible burden, a cost burden up front to the students that are going into college and to, to get them ready to actually take college courses. So one of the things is we need to make sure our primary education system is doing a good job of preparing our students to move into the, to, into the academic world. Also, I think we need to have a, a different pr approach for, for you. You need to think about this differently, about which classes are you going to take, which ones make sense to you. I went to college as an adult. I dropped out of high school did my thing and then went back to college. But I started at a community college. It was lower cost, it was more amenable to what I had to do and it fit my budget. So there's choices that we can make, but of course education is expensive and we'll, we'll have to look into what's driving those actual costs. I understand it's buildings and equipment, but we'll, ha we'll look at that. All right, um, mm -hmm. Ms. Payton, how do we lower college tuition costs for Vermont kids? Well, one of the important ways that we can do is we can do tuition service exchanges. So where we need healthcare professionals, we can uh, give them the tuition. And I think that any place that we're contracting or sending our contracts out of state, we ought to be training our people within state. Uh, furthermore, there are debt-free methods of education. If you want to learn anything, you can go learn it. Then we need a system of accrediting that learning, of testing out. There are, there's a uh, university online called the People's University that is just such a debt-free uh, educative system. So uh, along with that and increasing our food independence by giving people of your age land mm. in order to make our, our state food secure, uh, where that involves a lot of um, uh, transfer of, 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 you're gonna stop me, but we really need to do these things and we can, so I wish I had longer to tell you all the hopeful things we could do. Thanks. Uh, Ms. Erickson? I think the state of Vermont, Peter, correct me if I'm wrong, gives something like $44 million a year to University of Vermont. 
And that, that's an outrage. University of Vermont is a private for profit college and they just raise the tuition every year because they just get greedier and greedier and greedier. The state of Vermont should not be giving one penny to a private for profit college. All the money should go to the state colleges. And for that $44 million a year, we could have free online college courses. Mr. Shumlin. This is one of the great challenges that Vermonters are facing, which is the affordability of college. One of our challenges is that with all the money that we spend on education in this state, we haven't moved the needle one bit in terms of moving first generation students beyond high school. And we know that in this workforce, you can't succeed if you don't move beyond high school. So I've done two things, three things that are really important and I'm proud of. The first is early college and dual enrollment, which allows any high school student in Vermont now to get one year of free college in this state while they're in high school, either taking college accredited courses in high school or going to one of our nine participating state or local colleges. Second, we've made it possible now through my Vermont Scholars Program so that if you stay in Vermont and work for five years, we'll pay your entire year of college tuition if you do it in the field where we need you or an entire semester for an associate's degree. So it's about affordability. I understand that in a state that has one of the lowest unemployment rates in America where we're growing jobs, our employers need trained workers and this is the key to getting there. More Vermont students moving beyond high school. We're making progress. I'm proud of the progress we're making. Mr. Millen, how does that sound to you? Uh, that, that sounds like the same old story of uh, trust me and elect me and I'll do something different uh, going forward. Uh, nobody's been able to take advantage of the uh, two years of free college that uh, uh, Peter's been talking about on this campaign trail a lot. I think the uh, fact that Vermont is I think 48, 49, maybe 50 in the country level of support to uh, secondary to colleges and universities within the state is something that we should be ashamed of as a state. I think if you uh, uh, look at the children, uh, the young people, I'm sorry, out here in the audience, my father was able to work as a busboy in Lake George for the summer and pay tuition and park cars at night and come out of school with no debt. I was able to work pretty hard, take on a little bit of debt and pay for most of my own college. Now we see kids that are coming out of college with massive debts. We need to lower the cost of K through 12 education, be able to be more generous with folks from Vermont that want to stay within Vermont colleges and it's something that we'll be working very hard at. Mr. Diamondstone, to you. This issue of paying to go to school is, begins with an absurdity, and if you accept it, you've accepted the absurd. We should be paying people to go to school. School is work. Every economist from the far left to the far right agrees that the level of education of a society is part of its wealth. If a student goes to school and learns two and two is four, that student has contributed to the wealth of the society and should be paid. What do you call a person who gets room and board for their work? Slaves, all right? And that's a lot like the slaves in the workplace in all capitalism, where half the wages, fully half, is surplus value and is ripped off from them by the capitalists who own the industry. So we start with a rip-off system in every part of our society that has to be corrected, not just the education part. People should be paid to go to school, and it should come out of the social fund that we pay for kindergarten. Do you have any idea how much that would cost? Does it matter? Doesn't matter. Does not matter. Because once we, once we change to a system that is socialist in the economy, then we have people have money to spend because they haven't been ripped off half their salary by I the was just curious capitalist. If you know, uh, we're at the top of the hour here, and you're watching the gubernatorial debate here uh, on Vermont Public Television. We're delighted to have you with us. We have all seven candidates here in the studio in Colchester, and an audience of college uh, and high school students from around the state. Our next question concerns. Uh, it plays off some of those themes. It concerns uh, the economy and wages that have proven stagnant for an awful lot of Vermonters uh, for the last uh, five or six years. We hear that unemployment in Vermont is lower than many states, but uh, as you've heard, uh, the uh, uh, unemployment rate has started to climb up, and the Census Bureau tells us that uh, so has the number of our citizens living in poverty. So the question is, what as governor could you do to improve wages in the state? Mr. Milne. 
Thank you, Stuart. Uh, w one of the first things that uh, we need to do and um, is change the tone from the top in the governor's office. Uh, I believe uh, that Vermont has um, strengthened its reputation as not being a business-friendly state over the last four years. Uh, there's many examples that I could cite uh, uh, for that. But I think uh, with the uh, Scott Milne administration, uh, businesses will realize that uh, doors open, uh, let's give Vermont a try. We need to uh, come up with some sort of shots in the arm. We've got a very stagnant economy, as you pointed out, Stuart. Uh, uh, average household incomes are down, unemployment rates gone up by four tenths of a percent in the last month. Um, we need to do some tax incentives to stimulate business. Uh, we need to move forward with a robust uh, revitalization of our education system, which is a foundation for a great economy. Mr. Shumlin? Well, first, I just want to correct the facts. Uh, we have to remember the facts are difficult things to refute. We do have among the lowest unemployment rates in America. We have the lowest unemployment rate of all the New England states. When I go out and talk to employers, which I do constantly, they tell me, Governor, we need more trained workers. So the way we're going to grow jobs in the state and continue to grow them, and granted, incomes haven't gone up fast enough. There's too, too many Vermonters hurting. That's true in the nation, too. This recovery has been spotty. Americans in the middle class have not seen the income growth that, that we wish, and frankly, we've got more work to do. But the things that we're doing are important. First of all, balancing the state's budget without raising income taxes, sales taxes, and rooms and meals taxes. I've now done it four times. Paving roads and bridges. We've increased the number of paved, of, of uh, really poorly paved roads and bridges uh, in the state since I'm a governor. We've cut that almost by half. But most importantly, education from early child education to higher education to workforce retraining, we're succeeding in moving more folks into a prosperous future if we get them beyond high school, as I mentioned. And finally, health care costs. There's nothing that kills jobs and job creation more than the ever-rising cost of health care that cannot be sustained. How would you improve wages in the state, Mr. Donaldson? Start with the people of the state of Vermont rising up and taking over every major industry so that people can get paid a fair wage instead of being ripped off 50% by the employer. Um, and pharmaceutical is a good place to start. IBM is another good place to start. But to continue to talk about adding jobs, even at higher levels, is part of a ripoff. And it says, make more money so the capitalists can take more money away from you. All right? It doesn't say that you get to keep that money. It says that the capitalists can take 50% is what's called surplus value. All right? We need to co completely convert to a socialist system of manufacturing, production, and distribution, including in health care. Ms. Payton, how do you improve wages in the state? Well, uh, I, I was so thrilled when the Occupy movement happened because I felt that finally everybody got it, that the major banks are problematic for our economy. They are waging economic war against us. Uh, so the answers come in how can we uh, create a monetary system so that the uh, economy spurts up from the ground, investing in micro-business, making sure that we're contracting within state, taking off a tax on Vermont items, to have a Vermont branding where our brand is that our quality of our craftsmanship is as, is, as high as Swiss and German standards, things that are made to last. So we can circulate money from the ground up because trickle-down economics don't work. We need to lateralize our economy and I'll leave my website up so you can find out more. Thank you. Ms. Erickson? Yes, as Scott said, Vermont is not business friendly because it's not business friendly. Businesses cannot afford to pay the wages they would like to pay their employees. The students need to know why. The reason Vermont is not business friendly is the federal government and the state government, the legislatures, are passing laws saying that administrative officials may make rules and regulations. So the federal government 
U.S. Congress and the state government, state legislature in Montpelier are passing laws that are like blank homework papers. It's the equivalent of letting the janitor fill them in. They're saying that administrative officials who are not elected officials can make rules and regulations that businesses have to comply with. The administrative officials get wined and dined by lobbyists, but that isn't reported because they're not elected officials or candidates. Mr. Peters. Well, the economy is not very good in the state of Vermont because we're anti-business, I believe. You've got to make business come to you. I mean, uh, you just can't pass all these rules and regulations where it takes 10 years to send a business up. Businesses that want to come in, they want to send a business up and they want to start hiring people and they want to start making money and paying wages. If you've got to go through a process that takes all these years to do this, nobody's going to come here. They're going to go buy us like roadkill in the interstate. I mean, we got all these young people here going, going to school. We're spending thousands and thousands of dollars to educate our young people. Everybody else gets the benefit of our money that we invested in our young people. That's a bad investment when the investment you put into your kids leaves the state of Vermont at the rate they're leaving to go somewhere else because other people are waiting, just waiting, because we don't want to toe up and do what we're supposed to. Mr. Feliciano, how okay, do you so improve so wages? So as, just Governor, as Governor Shulman just said, right, we have expensive health care, we have high taxes, we have high cost of education, all on your watch. What we need to do is start cutting spending. If we start cutting spending, we can start reducing our taxes and that'll give it businesses an incentive to grow. We need to reduce some of the, we need to um, ease some of the Act 250 legislation, which creates a stifling effect where businesses can't grow and subsequently can't hire employees. So we have, we have high taxes that's preventing growth. We have uh, Act 250, which prevents buildings for, for, for companies from expanding in, this, in the local area. So those things are, are dooming our economy right there. But if we s focus in on cutting spending, reducing health care costs, and creating a more predictable, stable environment by easing some of the Act, 50 to Act, 50, Act 250 legislation, it's going to create an incentive for businesses to grow, more opportunities for you. So I'm not sure if it's a salary issue or it's more of a, I think it's more of a spending issue and we, once we start cutting our costs, which I'm, pr I'm promising to do, we'll have a growing economy again. Can you go back to this? We'd like to, uh, bring some of our uh, email uh, questions uh, that uh, some of our viewers have uh, submitted uh, this evening as well. And there's an interesting one about climate change, and it goes like this. Scientists have warned that carbon emissions from burning fossil fuels are causing climate change, and unless we keep more than 80 percent of the known carbon reserves in the ground, we will surpass uh, internationally agreed upon temperature rise limits of two degrees Celsius. Do you support divesting Vermont's pension funds from fossil fuel companies? Mr. Shumlin? I don't think we can move fast enough on climate change. As a governor who has now managed three climate change induced storms, including Irene, where we get 12 inches of rain dumped on Vermont in a very, sure, very short period of time, we've got to move quickly. That's why I'm so proud of the fact that we have built out renewables in this state incredibly quickly. We've quadrupled the number of solar panels since I've been governor. We're harnessing the wind. We're doing everything that we can to do energy efficiency right. In terms of divestiture, my view of that is it's not the sharpest tool that we have in the drawer. I'm willing to look at it. I do think that we should look at everything that we possibly can to move forward on climate change. And as governor, I will continue to be a leader in this area. But no divestment, is that right? It, my view is that it's not the sharpest tool that we can use, but I'm willing to look at it. As you know, it's not a simple question. We have a fiduciary responsibility, I do as governor, to ensure that we're getting a return on our retirement and pension plans. So there are a lot of reasons why it's not as simple as it looks, but I'm willing to look at it. Mr. Milne? Uh, one good reason to have fossil fuels in our portfolio is sort of to hedge uh, against the uh, uh, bet we're doing on uh, rushing towards this uh, renewable energy program that's uh, leading to, uh, you know, industrial high elevation wind turbines across Vermont and, and all kinds of other things. I, th I think a job of governors is to make choices. My choice coming into uh, the uh, next biennium is 
no need to look at divesting from uh, those kinds of stocks right now. We've got too many bigger problems to worry about. Mr. Feliciano. Or the divestiture. We need to do everything possible to ensure that the, our accounts are generating revenue. Right now, we have our retirement systems are three billion dollars out of actuarial balance. We can't afford to continue to divest from these fossil fuels that are yielding high returns and further increase that increase that rate. So, no, I do not support the divestiture of that uh, from the fossil fuels. Also. We've spent, an, we keep come back to spending, we've spent an incredible amount of money, $600 million in subsidies for renewable energy, and those renewable energy sources are only producing 2% at the most of the, of the energy sources. So we were spending money on all this renewable stuff that's not generating anything for us. So I would not divest, your, divest the portfolio because we need to somehow pay back the retirement funds that are $3 billion in debt. Ms. Payton? I don't think that Dan Feliciano's numbers are correct about subsidies. Um, I've been uh, educating about agricultural hemp, about the buildings that we can build that use a quarter of the fuel because it's such a hopeful way to deal with climate change. I also think we should divest. Of course we should divest. We've been sending our young people to war for, for oil. There, we do have the technology to get off of oil. We've got enough hydro in Vermont if we reclaimed the, the hydro on the river to, to give us enough power. And so we need to do that. In my household, my partner just put in air-to-air -air heat exchangers. That way, we are now off of oil. We need to get off of oil, and we need to look at things like solar roadways. We need to make our earth a priority because our relationship with the earth is how we're going to thrive in the future and I know we can do it. Divest uh, state pension funds, Mr. Diamondstein? I think we should divest all capital investments and open a state bank so that all investments of pension funds, which I understand we are now close to a billion and behind in, um, what? that we can uh, use that money to invest in Vermont. We do not need to invest in big corporations in order to make money. We need to invest in Vermont. The other thing is capitalism not only rips off workers, but it rips off the planet. And you are all aware of fracking and other mountain tops being cut away and so forth. Those things are destroying our planet, the place where we live. We mess in our own home. And that has to stop now. And that means getting away from competition, which is very wasteful. There's always a loser, right? There's always a bankruptcy. Thanks very much. Uh, Mr. Peters. Yes. Repeat the question, please. Do you think the state should divest its investments, its retirement investments, uh, in uh, fossil fuel companies, oil and gas companies? No, I don't think so. I think uh, a lot of investors probably are people like the rest of us, just invested and hoping to get some money for retirement, something to live on. As far as the climate change, we lost the mountaintop where I live so we could have green energy. Then they take the energy credits, and what do they do? They sell them to somebody who still pollutes. Everybody made money in between, but the ratepayer didn't. Hydro is the way to go. I mean, it's renewable. It's cheap right now. It's the cheapest than anything they have. And when they talk about climate change, they make it sound like the average person is totally to blame. But a lot of big corporations are doing a lot of damage. Look at the, look at the air that's flown every year. How many people fly? Look on military. Look at how much the military uses in fossil fuels. There's a lot of climate change right there. Ms. Erickson? Um, various government pension funds have been in the news in the past couple of years, uh, particularly with cities for fraud. So if I'm elected governor, first and foremost, I would do a complete forensic examination of the pension fund to find out if there has been any fraud going on because it's so common. And, you know, it just, it just happens. It's been in the news, and it, it's something you can't ignore. 
Um, so that's number one. Number two on climate change is if the F-35 strike fighter jets are, are based in Vermont, when they're flying, they give off nanoparticles of aluminum, and that will affect the climate. Thank you. Let's uh, bring in another one of our students. Uh, Beatrice, uh, you have a question about the drug problem. Do you think the existing measures to combat the drug epidemic in Vermont, such as raising penalties on out-of-state drug runners or increasing funding for treatment, are doing enough? If not, what would you propose? Let's begin with you, Ms. Payton. I think it's very important that we look at our pharmaceutical, our, our prescription practices. I think we are over prescribing opiates. Here in America, we have 95% of the opiate prescription practices, but only 25% of the population. We can reduce our, and we should reduce, how many opiates our doctors are prescribing and replacing them with other methods that are used around the world, including uh, marijuana for pain receptors. I know many, many people who have become hooked on heroin through uh, Oxycontin that's been prescribed. So we really need to rein back our, our prescription practices and begin to look at hypnosis, on meditation, on uh, marijuana, all these different methods of dealing with pain, for starters. And you, yep, thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Erickson, how do you feel about the Rosemary Joukowsky, the um, candidate for attorney general for the Liberty Union Party, um, two days ago she posted online that Peter Shumlin had given $5 million to a ski resort to buy a new snowblower, and that could have been used for a drug treatment facility. Peter, did you do that? <laughs> is, that your, is, it my, is it my turn or your turn? <laughs> are, you d are you done? I'm done. I'm done. Uh, okay, Mr. Peters, how do you feel about the state's approach to combating opiates? Well, uh, you got a lot of young kids, and nowadays, if if you do something like if you don't buckle them up or you do something wrong, you can be held liable for your for your child's safety and well-being. Mm. You got these drug dealers coming into this state, and they're dealing drugs to very young kids. And if you ruin them at 13, they're never going to be a productive citizen. I mean, if they take drugs very long, it won't be long before what they they can't tie their shoes or anything. You take a drug dealer, and when you get him, you come down hard on him. You make it known that when you come to Vermont, you get caught, you're going to do the time. We've got to have some judges. We've got to have some district attorneys that it's not, well, we, we give you 30 days. No, you've got to talk about years, and you've got to make it so that they're so scared to come here, that'll end part of your problem right there. Mr. Donaldson, are we doing enough? No, and I, I tend to go along with a lot of what Emily said, though I think it's while it's in the right direction or the correct direction, uh, it's not enough. Um, I have a socialist uh, libertarian view of this. On the socialist side, I say all drugs, whether they be contraband, whether it be heroin or whatever, and notice there was no heroin in the United States when the Taliban were in control in Afghanistan which if you use your head tells you how it gets into this country through the United States government. Um, that what we need to do is make it a crime, seriously, to be in private enterprise in the drug institution. And everybody ought to be able to take what they want um, and get it from a government service and pay cost because if the government taxes it, that will leave a gap in which private enterprise uh, can enter. And the one thing that we want to eliminate. Thanks, Mr. Shumlin. This is the one area that can really destroy Vermont's quality of life, is drug addiction, heroin addiction, opiate addiction. That's why I made it the focus of my State of the State address. That's why we have Vermont as a family focusing on this challenge. So let me answer the question, are we doing enough? No. What are we doing? We actually passed penalties to break, to really make it tougher for drug dealers who are bringing po this poison into our state, if they get arrested, they're going to do time. Second, we have moved it from a challenge where we're dealing with it simply as law enforcement challenge. We say law enforcement solve this for us, and we're saying that's not fair. Let's partner with them and deal with this as the healthcare crisis that it is. So Vermont's leading the way in fighting opioid addiction by saying 
Number one, we're going to clear the waiting list. If you need treatment, we want you to have a treatment center that you can go to. Number two, if you get busted, which is the most likely chance that will move you out of denial and into, into recovery, we're going to say, if you will go into recovery, follow this prescribed plan, you'll never see a judge, you'll never go to jail, we'll move you back into a productive member of society. Finally, what we're not doing enough is, of is prevention, but we've got communities all over Vermont coming together to figure out how do we deal with this, take responsibility for it on every street, every corner. We're going to make great progress. Mr. Feliciano. So the governor has gotten a lot of claim, you know, you know, a lot of people have been looking, looking forward to the governor, look, look up to the governor across the country for this problem, how he's addressing it. I want to wait and see what happens. I think it's a good approach, and I'm, I'm, I wouldn't do anything different right now. I'm, I'm optimistic, or hopefully optimistic, that the results will, will prove to be effective. So I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't tamper with what's going on. I'd like to see what the outcomes actually are. So it's, I know it's hard to believe that I agree with him, but um, on this one case, I do. <laughs> Mr. Mellon? Um, I also, uh, I think it's uh, something that I, um, applaud uh, Peter for, um, although, you know, we could Monday morning quarterback some of the nuances of the tone of making a, a big uh, entire state of the state speech, but I think we need to follow the data, see what's going on. I do believe it's not entire, entirely a law enforcement issue. Uh, I do hear these rumors or the, the data showing that people are moving to heroin from some of the other uh, drugs. I will say that if we can have an economy that's creating great jobs for young people, if we can have affordable college education that keeps people engaged in learning, uh, and if we can just get back to some of the more moderate ways of uh, typical Vermont living, that will be a good enabler of some success in this regard as well. Opiates uh, are a big problem facing the Department for Children and Families. It's been a pretty tough year at DCF, uh, the, including the deaths of uh, two young Vermonters uh, earlier in the year. Lots of ideas out there for reforming this agency uh, in the months ahead. I'm, I'm wondering what uh, the best one you've heard so far, Mr. Feliciano? I'm not sure if, I, if I've heard a good, a good idea yet. I think we, we, we need to take a good look and reorganize the whole structure so that we're, we're the kids are getting the services, that we're protecting the services, that we're protecting the children, our future Vermonters. As y many of you probably don't know, but I, I have a special needs daughter, and this is something that's very close to me. I want to make sure that the kids are getting the appropriate treatment, that they're being, um, their families are treating them well, and I think we need to just figure out by putting more, more, more people on the streets, more of the agencies, uh, more the officials on the streets, and less in the, in the state house, to focus in on that problem and make sure that when we find a potential case where our children's being harmed, that we intervene appropriately and take the corrective actions. So I think that's a better place to start focusing in on is reorganizing so that we have more people managing the cases and ensuring that the children are being protected. You're, you heard any good ideas, Ms. Payton? I have an excellent one. That we increase the uh, community involvement with families that are in poverty. Uh, we, for one, need to circulate more money so that we don't have such poverty or uh, half a living wage. But another thing that we can do is we can engage the community in mentorships which is important for also people who are in recovery or people who are coming out of the, the um, criminal justice system because uh, people need to make new choices when they're making bad choices. And in order to make new choices, they have to be around people who know how to make good choices to begin to understand how good it feels to make good choices for oneself. So when we create a, a mentoring system and coupling people with people who, who need to have help in that choice-making department, then we can engage the community, maybe do some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, barter or some uh, remuneration for that sort of service. Mr. Mill, how do you feel about reforming the Department for Children and Families? Um, the uh, best idea I came up with, and I, I don't want to um, make funny out of a very dire, uh, serious situation for uh, Vermonters, is uh, Lex Scott Milne, governor. Um, I believe that the um, Agency of Human Services is the biggest um, chunk of the state general fund. 
Uh, it really needs a governor that's going to be a full-time governor, that's going to be uh, picking a um, uh, person, man or woman, to run that agency that they're going to have a close working relationship with and really pay attention to the details that are going on. We've got uh, all kinds of problems in the headlines all the time coming from the Agency of Human Services. And uh, part of it I would uh, attribute to a governor who's been out of state 25% of the time for the last year uh, who hasn't really been paying attention to business. Mr. Shaman? Uh, you know, being governor is an extraordinarily uh, tough job. And one of the toughest things that I have to do as governor uh, is to actually hug the families of the folks whose child, children we lose in these awful tragedies. We could debate whether it's harder for, to be a drug addict or the child of a drug addict. But in every single case, whether it's DCF or the tragedy, the horrid tragedy we heard about up in Hardwick the other day, uh, when these circumstances happen, but where adults do awful things to their kids, it's almost always as a result of addiction. So what have we done? We have increased immediately the number of caseworkers that are working with each family, and we've got more caseworkers on the ground. We now have a policy where no child can be unified, reunified with their family in a difficult circumstance without the sign-off of a supervisor. And we're looking at other reorganizations within the department, but here's the point. DCF deals with the most difficult challenges imaginable, really tough challenges. We're the last stop on the train. We've got to do better to protect kids, Vermont's kids, with opiate addiction, heroin addiction, and other addiction. It's going to continue to be a challenge, but I'm committed to doing better than we've been doing, more staff, better communication, more transparency, and better service to Vermonters. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Erickson? My prayers to the families who have lost their children, but children's spirits are also being broken. I live eight miles from Springfield, Vermont. A year or so ago, uh, around 30 adults were arrested for drugs. Their photographs were put around town. Different store owners put up signs saying, not in our town. Well, th those people, the adults who were arrested and had their photographs and names plastered around town in, in newspapers, they were pre-trial detainees. They weren't convicted, they were pre-trial detainees. Now think how their children feel. Their children's spirits were broken. Now, Springfield, Vermont, you walk downtown and there's store after store after store is closed. You go to the Springfield Shopping Plaza, Radio Shack is out of business, Friendly's is out of business. You know, the place is closing down. So when you humiliate and demean a town, that doesn't help either. Mr. Diamondstone. We have an obsession with violence, um, killing all over the world. We have bases all over the world. We're bombing people whenever we feel like it. Um, the people who are injured are the dead and the injured in our battlefields, uh, whether they are um, adults or otherwise. And I'm, when I use that expression, adult, I don't think we should let anybody into the military who's under the age of 26 years. Um, that should be the div dividing line. Um, and we, you know, it, it affects both the environmental issue right to the top. I mean, no, 35 gallons to run a tank a mile, all right? So we have to stop the military, zero military budget, close all the bases, stop the factories that build all that equipment and ship it off to um, uh, the, the Zionist regime so that it can d defend itself against the, uh, gr the gigantic Gazan military. The question was about reforming the Department for Children and Families. Mr. Peters? Yes. Um, Mr. Shumlin mentioned more personnel, and the question would be, do we need more personnel, or would, do we need more training for the ones we have? What to look for? What to, what to be aware of? Probably a lot of these cases, the, the social worker, whoever went there, knew something was wrong, but their hands were so tied by rules and regulations that they couldn't do anything at that particular moment, which probably would have saved somebody's life. The person who usually commit these crimes probably had a previous record. They probably shouldn't even be around young children like that because if they got a criminal record that bad, something bad's gonna happen. And these people who go check on them, 
shouldn't have their hands tied. If they think something's wrong, they should be able to take action, whether it's call the police or whatever, immediately. And I think probably we'd have saved a few people. Thank you, sir. Uh, we're at the bottom of the hour, and a reminder that you're watching the gubernatorial debate here on Vermont PBS. Uh, next week, uh, we'll have the candidates for lieutenant governor, and in two weeks' time, the candidates running for the U.S. House of Representatives. And we invite you, of course, to join us uh, each Thursday night uh, this month for that. We have uh, in our studio here high school and college students, some of whom have some questions for our candidates for governor. And uh, we begin uh, with Addison. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Welfare, especially in today's economy, has been increasingly in demand. In more recent times, an alternative to food stamps has been created, electronic benefit transfer cards. The legitimacy of these cards' use has been in question. What do you believe would make these cards more efficient as well as increase their effectiveness? Or should Vermont change its current plan for welfare and turn in favor of other options? Mr. Peters, let's start with you. I believe, and if I was governor, that if people are working, people are paying out their Social Security to support somebody who don't want to work, possible, that you should not be able to buy alcohol, tobacco, or lottery tickets from what is given to you for what you're supposed to be using to take care of yourself and your family. Not only that, whatever the least Vermonter has to make for an income to live on that's working their butt off just to make their payments should be the bottom of what you're earning. Because I see a lot of people who are on the system that drive better cars than people who are working a full-time job and a part-time job. And if you're not earning your money, and somebody else is earning it for you, you shouldn't have all the good things and they shouldn't go without. Mr. Diamondstone? To each according to need, from each according to ability. That should be the catchword, the watchword of what we do. And you can do it in a guaranteed minimum income of $1,000 a month. You can do it any way you want. But we need to make sure that everybody has the minimum standard that they need for shelter, clothing, education. And I should tell you, when I went, first went to college, it cost me $10 a semester. When I came back out of the Army, I had to pay $10 a point. Boy, was I angry. All right. we, should, we need to understand that education is part of the essentials of life, along with clothing and shelter. So whatever we pick on as a figure, we should be able to use that well, maybe we should make adjustments for everybody, but we need to tax the people at the top to pay for it. Now they don't pay their fair share of taxes. Let's make them pay their fair share in Vermont. And if that doesn't work, we can secede and do it that way. Ms. Payton. Well, I'd like to germinate an idea that I hope is somewhere in everybody's head that uh, money is simply an accounting system. And right now, it's a system that's rigged by the uber wealthy. And our welfare system is keeping people in a state of helplessness by suggesting that they are so helpless. So what I want to see is I want to see an exchange happen where we are giving people welfare dollars. They need to be giving back in some ways. And we also need to have a livable wage, not a minimum wage where people are working for you know, 40, 50, 60 hours and bringing home $1,200 and not having enough to pay the heat and to pay their car. So most of our problems here are caused by enforced poverty of too low an income. And that's all I have time for. Ms. Erickson. For people who do need food stamps for families and individuals, they don't pay for the best types of food. They go get so little on the food stamps that they're not able to afford enough vegetables and fruits. And that's a real problem. Many low-income people are overweight and obese, and it ends up costing taxpayers more because there's more hospital visits and more doctor visits and more diabetes and more and more childhood diabetes because the cost of vegetables and fruits is so high that the people who do actually need the food stamps can't afford the vegetables and fruits. So if they take a couple of their food stamps dollars to buy a lottery ticket, maybe what they want to do is just win the lottery so they can afford fruits and vegetables. Mr. Feliciano? So I think, I think there's, there's two, pro there's, I'd like to separate this into two issues. There's, there's people who 
for one reason or another can't work that we need to take care of. Vermonters aren't going to throw Vermonters out in the street and we'll make sure that they can have, they can live and live a, a, live a decent life if it's no, no fault of their own. I think that there is some abuse in the system, but what we need to do is create more jobs. I think it, I keep coming back to if we cut spending, if we lower property taxes, if we increase, if we do a better job in our school systems, that people will have opportunities to grow. People will have op opportunities to learn. People will have opportunities to earn. And I think that's essentially what we need to do. Thanks very much, Mr. Milne. Uh, I, I agree that uh, a um, obligation of a uh, society is to take care of those who are least able to take care of themselves. Uh, uh, elderly, uh, very young, uh, and uh, folks that uh, are, find themselves in a situation where they need help from the government, uh, at least for a short time in their lives. There's a lot of big problems in Vermont as we look into the next uh, biennium. Uh, $100 million budget deficits, uh, healthcare system that's crashed that we gotta figure out how to resurrect uh, some sort of uh, working system for us with uh, economy that's in the tank. Um, my understanding is that the um, food stamp successor, this electronic funds transfer payment system is federally regulated. So my priority list would be talk to Peter Welch, Pat Leahy, Bernie Sanders about that. I think it's a federal issue there. I agree, we gotta get the economy going. There's all kinds of things we need to do. We don't wanna lose track of our obligation to take care of those that need help. Mr. Shumlin. Well, let me talk about what we have done because it's a very good question. This is what we've done. We've taken the EBT card and made it possible for Vermonters to buy uh, food at, at, at farmers markets in Vermont, good, wholesome, best food in the country grown by our local farmers, getting more fruit, vegetables grown locally into the folks uh, who are using the cards. But second, there isn't, a Vermonter, there isn't a Vermonter who wants to leave anyone behind. But we also, when I became governor, were the only state w left where you could stay on welfare, on assistance, for more than five years. My job as governor, is to make sure that we're moving folks from assistance to work. So we put an end to that. We got rid of the five-year requirement. Instead, we are training Vermonters for the work through our labor department so that we can give them the skills they need to get a job. Now, despite the doom and gloomers on the panel here with me, Vermonters have jobs. Vermont uh, employers are hiring. Their challenge is they can't find enough trained folks to do the work they have. So that's why we're training everybody, including folks on assistance, for jobs. That's why we've raised the minimum wage. That's why we've made it possible for the EBT card to be used in farmers markets. We're making progress, and it's changes that will serve Vermont well going forward. Mr. Milne, you mentioned the, the $100 million budget gap that uh, might be facing the next legislature. We don't know exactly <coughs> what the number is going to be yet. But I'm wondering, and this is a question for everyone, uh, if you're in the governor's chair, would you would you would you, could you accept any revenue increase, uh, or would it all be spending cuts? And if so, where? Mr. Mill? Uh, uh, thank you, Stuart. I, uh, first of all, uh, the question's a little bit backwards. Um, how did we get in this situation? Uh, four years of the rate of spending by the state of Vermont, led by uh, our governor, uh, about three times the rate of growth of revenue. Uh, we've got a, uh, a governor who brags that he hasn't raised the income tax, hasn't raised the sales tax, hasn't raised the rooms and meals, meals tax. Yet behind the curtains, there's all kinds of gimmicks going on. Uh, there's a continuing cost shift from other tax sources to property taxes, which has really created this crisis of affordability that we really need to figure out. Um, I don't see big spending cuts being uh, a solution. We need to manage uh, government intelligently and uh, get back on track. Um, there are clearly some opportunities uh, to be smart with how we're spending money. Mr. Shumlin? Well, I'm proud to say that I've managed four consecutive budgets, deficit budgets, as Scott just mentioned, without raising taxes on our working Vermonters. We've uh, now managed four straight budgets and we're about to do another. So the interesting thing about my opponent is he'll never tell you how he's gonna do it. He'll just complain about what we have done. Listen. I'm proud of what we've done. We not only have managed four straight budgets without raising income taxes, sales tax, and rooms and meals taxes, but at the same time, we've picked priorities that are important. For example, we passed the two biggest transportation budgets in the history of the state. That has meant that we've drastically reduced inadequate roads, inadequate bridges, literally cut the number of inadequate bridges in this state 
from 22% to 12% of our bridges. At the same time, we've invested in property tax reduction by dedicating more of the sales tax to the education fund. We have actually secured uh, our, our, our pension programs going forward by working with the teachers to reduce long-term obligations there. We've got the best bond rating of any of the New England states, AAA, because of the fiscal management that we're employing. So one of the things I'm proud of is bringing my business skills to state government to manage to the ability of Vermonters to pay, and that's helped the state grow jobs. Mr. Diamondstone, higher taxes, spending cuts, combination of both. Higher taxes. And, you know, we have that available, as you know. Social Security is not paid on the income from gambling in the stock market. 13% of the wealthy's income is, uh, is free from that. Um, their dividend income and their bo uh, uh, bond income, interest income, is freed from that. So let's tax it here in Vermont. Um, if the feds don't want to do it, well, that's their problem. And we have this problem, you know, the Republicans and the Democrats get together on so many things, you know. You, all of them are together on uh, turning Burlington into Bagram II. All of them are together on um, uh, sending weapons all over the world, uh, to, in, including to the, uh, the Zionist uh, government in in um, in uh, Ms. Payton, spending cuts, tax increase, or some combination of the two to close uh, this budget. Uh, may I add another element? Uh, may I do that? Sir? Sure. Uh, we also need to look at our banking system. Uh, in every, every other uh, scenario, we have a public element and a private element, like we have public schools and private schools. In banking, it's we're always benefiting Wall Street. So we can take the value of our taxes and put it in a state reserve bank, a public bank, so that when we, when we uh, lend out, the value goes back to our treasury. Right now, we're supporting the tar sands by putting our money in TD Bank North, and that is so environmentally degrading that it's just awesomely important to stop that. Uh, so if we have a public reserve bank, we can also circulate more money that we won't need so many of our governmental agencies, because poverty is the reason why we have so many agencies. Thanks. Uh, Ms. Erickson? First of all, I would make marijuana legal and tax it. Second of all, I would reinstate all the rest areas on the state highway that Peter Shumlin has removed. And I would save the state from a horrible lawsuit that the state is about to have. Heads up, Peter, when people work for the State Department of Transportation, now that part of it um, Interstate 89, you can go 74 miles without a restroom. One man told me he has diabetes. Well, he has a right to work under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and he has a right to a reasonable accommodation. He needs to go to the bathroom once an hour, but he can't because there's no restroom for 74 miles on 89, and he works for the State Highway Transportation. So he has to leave the highway and go to some little town, and then he has to pay money to go to the bathroom. Peter, you're going to face a big loss lawsuit from the, a class action lawsuit from the state of Vermont for closing down rest areas and denying your own employees the right to go to the bathroom. You are uncivilized. All right, uh, Mr. Peters. Yes, I think it's a combination of more than one thing. Uh, I know when I work for the agency of transportation, usually you've got a budget. And the way it's set up right now, unless they've changed it, if you don't spend all your money, you don't get that money back they cut you there should be an incentive program so any agency that saves money gets a certain percentage of it it's an incentive program not only that they can say well there's um they haven't raised taxes but i think they call it fees now and i know i've paid a lot of fees lately the other thing too is uh it might be a bad word but we have all kinds of skiing all kinds of snow machining and where do a lot of people go in vermont they go out of state to gamble we could just as well have some casinos here next to the ski areas, put them outside the ski areas so they have to travel to them and spend money in our small towns. And that's the both, well, you get your income, you get your skiers, you get everybody happy. And most of all, the taxpayers, because the taxes aren't going up. All right, Mr. Feliciano. 
we definitely have to cut spending. As, as you heard, our taxes are too high. Our business environment isn't as friendly as the governor would lead you to believe. Our economy is growing at about 1.5% per year. That doesn't bode very well for the, our, the young people of Vermont. So let's, I'll be bold about this. We need to cut Vermont Health Connect. That'll save about 26 to $36 million a year. We need to cut Efficiency Vermont. That's not really doing anything for us. I've had them over to our house and our property, and they didn't do much for us. We need to reduce inmate health care spending. That's, we're the second highest in the country. And we need to stop this ridiculous single payer that's only going to drive up costs and re increase the cost of doing business in Vermont. So we need to cut spending, definitely, and we need to create a more, um, a more business friendly environment. Quickly, Mr. Shumlin, do we have a liability here with our uh, lack of restroom facilities? You know, we've actually been adding rest area facilities. We built a new one in Bennington. I cut the ribbon on that uh, re uh, re recently. Uh, it's beautiful. We've got a great one coming into the state. And I think we have the right number we're trying to add, as you know, one down in Randolph. So we're going to continue to work on it. Why? You've taken them out <laughs> in 91 and 89. I, I, I can assure you that there have been no rest areas removed under my governorship. We've been building them, not taking them away. We're spending. Uh, we're spending. All right. We uh, don't have a whole lot of time, but I, 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 uh, this next question will we'll please uh, keep this to 30 second answers, but I'm just wondering, if you're elected governor, and you could, under cover of darkness perhaps, uh, sneak a law through the legislature that you'd just love to get passed, but no, it probably wouldn't. Uh, Mr. Diamondstone, which one would it be? No such thing for me. Closed government is an anathema. That is the beginning of fascism. So as far as I'm concerned, any law that's passed under the cover of darkness is part of the development of fascism. And so every transaction carried on by our government should be open for us to look at. A great idea you'd love to get through if the legislature wasn't watching, Mr. Peters. I'd like to get a repeal of one that was passed last January that's been really a sore to me, and that's the Lakeshore Protection Act. That, as far as I'm concerned, it's the biggest land grab by the state than it was when the government took land from the Indians. It's a land grab. Mr. Feliciano. You know, come on, Stu. Act 48, we need to stop this single-payer health care scheme. It does nothing to reduce health care costs. And we need to focus our energies on growing the economy and not putting some sort of boondoggle in place. We have no, no chance of implementing a single-payer health care system that's going to save money. And we, have, we do not have the skills to implement it as demonstrated by the poor implementation of Vermont Health Connect. Ms. Payton. Well, I'd like to make sure that every public debate for public office it includes every balloted candidate. Uh, I will say I've been running for three elections a as an independent, and uh, the Rutland Herald, Times Argus, Vermont Digger, Seven Days, and um, other uh, press have never, ever run one article about my platform so that you know what I have to offer. So I think it's very important to be able to reform government that we have a level playing field at, at our elections. Ms. Erickson. I can make any law I want. Anything you want. Okay. Number one. It, 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 this Just is gonna one. Be part A, okay, part A, part B, part C. <laughs> part A, no, no motorboats on Lake Champlain. One third of Vermonters draw their drinking water from Lake Champlain. Motorboats drip oil and gas which contain lead. Let's stop polluting the people's drinking water. Number two, no get natural gas pipeline underneath Lake Champlain. They leak, they have explosions. Children will get killed swimming in Lake Champlain. Number three, we've gotta stop dumping treated sewage into Lake Champlain and uh, rerouted elsewhere. All right, uh, Mr. Milne. Um, I would uh, try to sneak in a, a line item veto for the governor. Mr. Shumlin, how's that sound to you? No, well, I hate it in the legislature, but it sounds like a great idea now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did we give, yeah, everybody got a, uh, a shot at that one. Uh, we're uh, running short on time, and we have seven candidates, uh, so we need to move along to closing statements uh, tonight, and we'll begin with, uh, with you, Ms. Payton. Oh, thank you. Um, this is probably the last time that I'm, I'm going to be running, but I'll leave my website up for anybody who wants to uh, see the solutions that I put up there. And I want uh, our people to think about what is more important to you, 
is, is if you could have all the money in the world or you could have all the love in the world, which has more value? We have elevated money to a godlike status and it is just an accounting system. So I, I urge the people of Vermont to make our, your decisions to improve the quality of, of loving in your life, uh, of the brotherhood and sisterhood, because it is the quality of love in the community that gives us spiritual wealth. And we are very uh, spiritually wanting in this country. Uh, peace can be managed just the way we manage war with appropriate monetary policy. And we can grow and thrive. Thank you. Closing statement now from Peter Diamondstein. Uh, I want to touch on two things. One is the obit writers for Jim Jeffords left out one of the finest things about him, which was he would never go to a candidate's forum unless all the other candidates were invited from 1980 on. And I remember the big one he blocked was in Rutland where he said, I won't come because you didn't invite everybody else. Um, I think that's a demand we should make on every incumbent who is seeking re-election. You don't go unless everybody's invited. Second thing is violence. The violence to workers, the violence to the planet, the violence that we do to people all over the world. We need to stop spending our resources on that and we need to reallocate that for the benefit of the planet and for the benefit of everybody who's living on this planet because everybody is entitled to live. All right, and we need to be able to make sure that everybody. Thank you. Chris Erickson. I'm friend. Chris Erickson. If you vote for me, I will do everything I can to stop the F-35 strike fighter jets from being based adjacent to the Burlington Airport in Chittenden County, the largest populated area of Vermont. They are designed to be dual capable of carrying nuclear bombs. They are not safe to be based in a large population citizen area. If one jet crashes in Lake Champlain, that will permanently destroy the drinking water for one third of Vermonters. Again, and I'm Chris Erickson. If you vote for me, I will do everything I can to stop a natural gas pipeline from being built underneath Lake Champlain because natural gas pipelines are in the news year in and year out nationwide for pipe leaks, pipe bursts, and pipe explosions. They will pollute the lake water from which one third of Vermonters draw their drinking water. This has got to stop. Vote for me. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Dan Feliciano, Libertarian. Okay, so I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a veteran. I have three young children. I have a lot of skin in the game here in Vermont, and I want to see Vermont succeed and be more prosperous. Um, quite frankly, I'm disappointed that Governor Shumlin's standing here claiming all these victories when the numbers don't justify it. He keeps talking about the numbers, and then when you challenge him on the numbers, he says, let's not quibble about them. I'm also quite disappointed that Scott Millen is standing here next to me as a Republican candidate and hasn't put form a platform or plan. I am running as governor because I think we need to stop the single-payer health care system and cut costs, health care costs, by opening up the marketplace. We need to cut spending. My background is in cutting spending and improving efficiencies in both local and state governments, as well as private industry. We need to cut the property tax, and we need to provide more school choice so that our young families can generate more hope for their children and have a more affordable place to live and choice in their education system. So if you want someone who's going to make sure that Vermont can continue to grow, continue to be more prosperous, and challenge the status quo by making bold statements and bold challenges, I'm the candidate, Dan Feliciano. Thank you, sir. Next, Bernie Peters. Yes, I'm Bernie Peters again, and I'm asking for your vote on November 4th. I am a candidate that is about as grassroots as you're going to get. I don't have big business behind me. I don't have corporations behind me. I don't have nobody from out of state behind me because I look at this this way. I'm a Vermonter running for a Vermont office for the Vermont people. And when you get money for a candidate that all comes from out of state, how can you say that you're a Vermont candidate? You must be an out of state candidate because it's not Vermont money behind you. It should be Vermont money. We need reform on this. It shouldn't be a much money issue. It should be so much for each one. When it's gone, it's gone. 
I believe that I'm the right candidate because it's time to get back to a working person with common sense, and I'm both. Thank you. Now uh, to uh, Democrat Peter Schumer. It's been a huge privilege to serve as governor for the past four years, and I'm asking your vote for your vote for two more years. Listen, we've made some great progress, as has been outlined tonight. We have more work to do. I ran for governor originally because I love this state more than anywhere else, and I want to make this state a place where more young people can succeed, where we can grow jobs, economic opportunity, and preserve our quality of life. We're going to wake up on November 5th, and one of the seven of us is going to be governor. This is an important election. Who your leader is makes a huge difference for Vermont. I'm asking for your vote so that we can continue the good work that we've begun because we've got more work to do, and I hope that you will give me your support. Thank you for this privilege. Thank you, and our final closing statement will be from Scott Milne. Uh, Stuart, uh, uh, Vermont Public uh, Broadcasting, uh, thank you, uh, fellow candidates. I want to thank uh, everybody for what's been, a, I, I think, a traditional good Vermont campaign where we're talking about issues and, and positive things. Also, a uh, shout out to the audience. Uh, it's great to see young people engaged. Uh, I've been engaged in uh, watching Vermont politics since I was very young. I want to do a shout out to uh, my mom, uh, Marion Milne, who uh, died uh, about a, a month and a half ago. Um, 1994, 20 years ago, my mom was running for the state legislature for the first time in Orange County, uh, was really handicapped as an underdog with a steep hill to climb to even get elected. Her campaign theme, and really I would say the foundation of her legislative career and her life was, I'm just naive enough to believe that I can make a difference. My mom ended up winning that race. Uh, I think if you know her or learn about her, she did make a difference in her life. What I would ask everybody here and people watching is to join me. Be naive enough to believe that you can make a difference. Look at each of us, decide which one you want to support, get a couple people out to vote with you, and it'll be an election that can go your way. Thank you, Mr. Millen, and thank, thanks to all of you uh, for being with us tonight. That concludes tonight's program. We invite you to join us right back here next Thursday evening for the debate featuring the candidates for lieutenant governor. Uh, we'll be on the air at 8 o'clock followed the following week with the candidates for the U.S. House of Representatives. Mark Johnson will be moderating uh, for those events. And of course, don't uh, miss tomorrow night's weekly reporter roundtable right here Vermont this week, starting at 7.30. Until then, I'm Stuart Ledbetter, News Channel 5. For all of us here at Vermont PBS, we thank you and good night.